Oh, this mic is on, yeah. Um, so the, the talk on the, on the schedule was named uh, Host Pathogen Interactions. And I, I, I do have a talk uh, very specifically on that, about uh, malaria, malaria parasites. Um, but I gave that in previous hands-on schools. And, to, and today, I wanted to try th this other subject on you. It also, in some ways, leads to host pathogen interactions. Because um, what you're seeing here is the surface of a parametrium uh, single-cell animal. It's, it's a little animal uh, a few tens of microns long that swims uh, in ponds. But a very similar situation with 10 uh, micron uh, active beating filaments exists in our airways. And it, these things are constantly beating and moving the mucus up through the airways and into our digestive tract and keeping that surface of the airways always uh, clean and, uh, and uh, renewed. And that is actually the first barrier we have against um, pathogens, airborne pathogens like bacteria uh, that, that somebody, might, might be, uh, somebody else might be emitting through cough, for example. And uh, and also, that, that surface of the airways is therefore also full of immune cells and, and uh, systems that the body has in place to start triggering uh, reactions against uh, pathogens. But today, I chose this other talk for two reasons. One is that I think it latches on nicely with other talks you've heard through the weeks on uh, nonlinear systems, and many of you work on chaos and, and uh, synchronization and, uh, and similar questions, and, and there are elements of that in, in my talk. Um, and um, and the other reason is more kind of uh, uh, kind of his, I guess um, history of my own group. I wanted to show you what started off as a very very simple project before I had a group when I was just working me with some summer students, and then a kind of the success story of how kind of that thread became kind of a big tree, a uh, big funded project uh, funded by a European ERC grant, with a, with now a team of uh, six or seven people working on a on all the leaves of, of, of this tree. So <clears throat> when I look back to it, uh, I don't think it's particularly um, my, my own kind of ability that, that got me there. I think there were signs of, of what can make a good project that perhaps uh, uh, kind of can be a lesson to, to everyone, even if you don't care specifically about uh, the, the content of my talk. All right, so, so now uh, I think the, uh, right. So this is actually my, my group today. We recognize here Nicola, who, who is here at the hands-on school, uh, and me there. Uh, this is Yuri, who has been a long-time postdoc in my group and has built a lot of the equipment. And everybody else here are PhD students and postdocs doing a, a variety of things. So about a third of these people work on the uh, questions that I will uh, go through during my talk this morning. OK, so I compiled a rather, rather large amount of information into 45 minutes. I apologize. I, I will go quickly, but the, the point is I don't want you to focus on all the details and all the figures precisely that I, I'm telling you. I, I'm really trying to tell you a story of how we built up uh, bits of uh, fundamental physics, how we started talking to biologists and, and medical people, and how we tried bringing all of this together. So I, I will briefly tell you about low Reynolds number flows, because that's the, kind of the underlying uh, fluid dynamics behind many of the questions that we're posing here. Uh, the, the core of the talk is uh, uh, um, <clears throat> a bunch of model experiments that we managed to publish um, tr trying to dissect the, the essential physics of how those, uh, those beating filaments that you saw in the wave uh, phase lock together and are actually able to, to generate spontaneously that collective dynamics that uh, shows up as a wave, which is very important for the, for the mucus clearance and for transport of fluids and for swimming. Um, and then briefly at the end, I will show you examples of the things that we're carrying out now with biological samples uh, and, and living cells that have uh, cilia. Okay, so the Reynolds number was introduced yesterday already in, in uh, Dan Goldsman's talk. It's the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. And typically, if you're thinking of an object uh, translating through a, a liquid, uh, you've got the, uh, the density, the velocity, the typical size of the object and the viscosity of the fluid down here. And if this number is much less than one, then it means the viscous forces are dominating and there is no turbulence. Um, and and the, the equations of motion that are the Navier-Stokes equation uh, here actually simplify a lot because you can start dropping the terms with, which are kind of quadratic in the velocity. And they become linear equations. So. Um, 
what, what's important is that if, if you are a, a, a normal sized person, even swimming slower than Michael Phelps, you will still be swimming at a very high Reynolds number if you try swimming in the sea. Uh, but just plugging in the corresponding numbers into this ratio here. But if you're a small object, say um, a few microns big, and you're swimming, say, 100 microns per second, then when you plug those numbers into here, you get to 10 to the, to the minus 4, say, order of magnitude. So, so micron-sized objects, essentially because they're very small, they, they, they give you very low Reynolds numbers. And that's true also of the cilia beating. You put 10 microns, you put the frequency, the, the, the typical speed uh, uh, at which they're beating through the fluids, and you come up with a, a, a non-turbulent flow around those cilia. And it will be equivalent uh, as ourselves trying to swim in uh, jam or, or Nutella. Um, so you, you have to come up with strategies in that situation that don't rely on inertia. You can't kind of do a breaststroke motion that then kind of lets you glide for a little bit before doing another one because the, inertia, the friction forces stop you immediately. You've got to come up with some, something that looks more like uh, uh, crawling, I guess. <clears throat> okay, so if we have the general Navier-Stokes, but then we start simplifying for a small Reynolds number, then we come up with this uh, linear equation that I mentioned. And, uh, and a lot of this was calculated already uh, 100 and 100 years ago or previously in terms of uh, what, what velocity profiles you would expect around uh, bodies with, uh, with specific geometries. And also, for example, if you have one sphere moving through a fluid and a second sphere somewhere else, what forces does the second sphere feel because of the motion of the first sphere? Um, these things were calculated by Stokes, by Ozine, who were fluid dynamicists in the uh, 19th century. Um, Many of you know, actually, the, the uh, drag coefficient if you are moving a sphere through a fluid. Certainly, in, in my hands-on session, everybody who went through that uh, got reminded of this. Um, also important, um, if you're thinking of filaments moving fluids, is the formula that corresponds to what happens to a cylinder. Uh, a cylinder perpendicular to, to its uh, axis has a high drag coefficient, uh, higher than uh, along the axis. More or less, there's a factor of two difference if, if the cylinders are uh, of a sensible aspect ratio. Um, and this is important because if um, one of the strategies for moving is to have a, a high drag coefficient for one part of your motion and then a low uh, drag coefficient to recover your original conformation and then high drag again, low drag. And this way you can make a periodic cycle that has different drag coefficients in the two parts of the cycle and uh, allows you to actually put force into the fluid. If you were simply moving the same filament back and forth without changing drag, you would just be pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling with the same force, and you wouldn't be moving anywhere. <clears throat> so what really allows you to have a different drag coefficient, in essence, is the fact that an, on a filament, each little piece, you can think of it as a little cylinder, and you can move it parallel or perpendicular to uh, to, to, to the overall motion. You can position it in, into, into, with, with different angles. Okay, so another bit of physics, uh, fluid dynamics, that is underlying what I'm going to tell you later is, is the interaction between uh, spheres. So if you, you all probably have in mind that if, uh, if I'm at low Reynolds number and I'm, I move an object uh, with some velocity, the, the force that I need is proportional to that velocity, and the coefficient is the drag coefficient. So there's a more general uh, systems of equation that you can write if you have more than one object. So now this kind of generalizes the idea that velocity is proportional to the force. It, it's now uh, the velocity of object n is proportional to the forces acting not just on object n, which would have been the, the single object pushed, but the forces acting on all the m objects, or, well, all the objects in the system. And uh, it's still a linear relation because the equations are still low Reynolds number linear Stokes equations. Uh, but I have like a, a mega tensor here relating all of these velocities to all of these forces. And Ozine was the person to, to calculate what you have to put here to, to relate uh, the velocities to the forces. So in general, if, this is a, if these guys are 3D velocity vectors and these forces are, are 3D velocity vectors, uh, and I have uh, n objects in the system. This beast here is n by n matrix, but the elements are three by three little matrices. So it, it can be like a, a gigantic thing to, to write out. Um, 
But if, if I consider a much more simple situation where I just have two objects and I only want to think about the motion uh, on the axis that connects them, then uh, all of this stops being vectorial. I simply have a scalar, one scalar equation, um, well, two, an equation for, for object one and an equation for object two, but both are just uh, uh, scalar equations. And in particular, say, if I have two spheres and I try to move sphere one with velocity one, then uh, I need force one, and this is the, just the, the Stokes drag that I think is well known to many of you. And then um, I also need to consider with what force the sphere two is being held and the distance between sphere one and two. This accounts for the fact that there's a fluid flow and uh, the forces on sphere two are, are giving me also uh, an effect on, on sphere one. If sphere two is there but nobody is holding it, basically I can move sphere one um, as if that one wasn't there because sphere two will be just uh, moved off by, by the fluid flow that I generate by moving sphere one. All of this is true for, uh, it's mathematically true for, uh, for point-like objects, so it's a, it's a far field uh, theory that Sozin made to, to get to here. All right, and this is the more general uh, form um, with, with, with uh, kind of bold vectors and, and matrices. And, and what I've written here is actually the, the more general um, equation with, with, with a noise term. So what I'm thinking now is, if I have microscopic objects, I want to write the Langevin equation. So I want to write uh, uh, the equation of motion with, with my external forces, these forces of interaction that depend on the velocities of all the beads and the Ozine tensor, and also a stochastic force that moves them about. Um, well, there are some details about what you're allowed to put in this noise term, because since the particles are coupled through the fluid flow, the noise term also needs to take needs to know about this coupling, otherwise you're violating uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem. But that, that's just a detail. If you're thinking of doing simulations of moving spheres, then you've got to kind of uh, write, put, put a sensible noise term uh, in the system. But, but the, the most important thing that I want to stress is that these hydrodynamic forces decay as one over the distance. And that's, that in, uh, in physics, uh, we always think of it as a very long range interaction, because one over d takes a long time to go away. It's not an exponential, and it's not a, a power law with, with a high exponent. And it really means that when, when you have a system of lots and they're moving, you have to think of it as a many-body system. It's like it's one. You can't really kind of cut off this interaction and expect to, to be calculating the right properties for the system. Interestingly, though, if your spheres are doing what they have to do close to a, a wall, so imagine they are now close to this uh, pavement and everything is full of liquid, then uh, the, um, the boundary condition given by the pavement changes this interaction and you get a power law that decays as the cube of the distance. So, so for objects creating their fluid flows next to a wall, uh, the interactions are much more short range. And this difference is going to turn out to be very important to describe uh, waves. Um, it's much more difficult to come up with a situation where phase oscillators will assemble into traveling waves if you have the one over d interaction. And it's much more simple if you have the one over d cube uh, because it looks much more like a nearest neighbor interaction. And uh, if you've been to big stadiums where people stand up and do the traveling wave of standing up because they're very happy and it's a way to pass time as well, uh, well, that is a nearest neighbor interaction which creates a traveling wave. And uh, that parametrum, the cilia on that parametrum are doing uh, an, uh, an analog of that kind of Mexican wave uh, around the stadium. Okay, so, so this work really started about uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, we, we had just built uh, optical tweezers, and we were able to, to trap colloidal particles. And w one of the things we did was um, we, we trapped um, particles. In this case, you can see three. These are uh, uh, 3.5 micron diameter particles. Then we trapped four, five, etc. And in this experiment, the traps were fixed. They didn't move. So it's actually a very simple, if once you have optical tweezers, it's kind of almost the simplest experiment you can do. You just have a static trap. And we just had several static traps and managed to put a colloid in each one. And what we did in this work was we studied the fluctuations of, this, uh, of these uh, kind of particles put in these po polygonal arrangements. And uh, it turns out that the, if you look at the 
cross-correlated motions in these thermal fluctuations, then uh, they, are they are well described by the Ozine tensor. So this was really just a check that we had learned properly how to think about the Ozine tensor in this situation. And the, the reason why we could actually publish it as a paper was also that th these polygons are so regular that the Ozine tensor matrix has a very simple form. And you can write it down um, analytically as a simple formula, even for the case of many, many beads. And you can diagonalize it analytically. So, so for this case, we could calculate the eigenmodes and eigenvectors of the Ozine tensor, which meant we could characterize the, uh, the correlations in, in these fluctuations. And that, that's kind of... No, with traps on, they, they are jiggling, and uh, you let them jiggle for several minutes, and you record all these random jigglings. Yeah, no, they're important. The traps are creating harmonic wells. Uh, so each of the particles uh, is in its own well. Um, and then in addition to being, uh, you, you could do the same experiment just with one. And that's what everybody does with tweezers to calculate how strong <coughs> the, the trapping potential is. Um, but now there are several, and each one is in its well. And then as, so as, uh, as well as the harmonic trapping, they, they've got the interaction through the velocities. So the. Um, So our, our tweezer um, had a, a device called Acousto Optical Deflector, um, which, which is basically a Bragg grating that you can, uh, you, you, where you can tune the spacing by putting a radio frequency field. It's a standard um, kind of a, a opto electronic gadget that you have to buy and then control. Uh, and this way, a single beam can be time shared between different positions uh, on the focal plane. Um, because you can, uh, you can uh, much more quickly than any dynamics in the system, you, you can, you can uh, steer the beam. Ah, yeah, so we were careful. Yes, it, it does, because it's the same one beam which gets shared between more and more positions. But, but in these experiments, we were careful to, to calibrate so that uh, we, we, we had the, the situation where we were weakest, with, with, uh, with uh, I think our maximum was 10 beads that we could actually trap. And then the other experiments, we did reducing the uh, laser power. Thanks. OK, so I will skip the maths. Um, and the other thing we were doing very early on, as well as static traps, was try to think if we could uh, move uh, beads to, to create a fluid flow. And this links to, to what Dan was telling you yesterday, this, this very nice uh, kind of Purcell idea uh, of scallop theorem. Uh, maybe I can get the scallops to swim. I don't know if everybody has seen scallops. We've got scallops. So you can all see these dead shells. I don't know how many of you know about this. They open and close and they So, uh, so the scallop only has one degree of freedom. It can only open and close with one angle. So Purcell said, uh, well, such a thing, a low Reynolds number cannot flow, cannot swim, because y you, you are doing a motion which is reciprocal in time, and the equations are linear, and, and you will just end up putting the same amount of force into the fluid in one direction as in the other direction if you just do that. But of course, these scallops can swim, as uh, the YouTube video shows, uh, and that's because they're not working at low Reynolds number. <clears throat> they're making a jet, so they're playing with inertia. And then Purcell went on to show, to make this uh, the simple set of, uh, well, three, three linkers, so two angles, and, and all of you are going through the robotics lab where you play with a, a version of this, um, not in water, but, but as, a, as a robot on, on land, um, or, or in beads. Um, and and anyway, so Purcell suggested this was, in some ways, the, the simplest object uh, capable of uh, swimming, of self-propelling. And uh, that was, uh, in what year was Purcell? It was early uh, 20th century, I think. Um, so then, much more recently, um, Najafi and Golestanian, who were at the time working in, in Iran, and then uh, Rami Golestanian went, came to the UK, in, in 2004, they, they published uh, two or three theory papers where they calculated um, 
the hydrodynamics of a situation with, with three spheres, where by changing the distances between the two spheres, uh, they could play the same game as the angle in the Purcell swimmer. Um, actually, Professor De Simone here also has papers on the efficiency of uh, when you have more than one of, of these sets of uh, three sphere swimmers. But the idea when you have a single uh, three sphere thing is you change the distance, say here I change the distance on the right, I move the right bead closer up, then I move the left bead closer up, then I move the right bead out, and finally I move the left bead out. And this sequence is different, I mean it, it's symmetric left-right if you break time up down. So uh, so it knows about I mean it it knows about direction if you give it a knowledge of time and it will go the other way if you turn time the other way around. So so this object is non-reciprocal in time and um, as Purcell had said, uh, and uh, and Ramin Golestanian and Alina Jaffe had calculated, it should be able to swim. So we didn't build it as a robot. Nobody has done that on the Markran scale yet. What we did was just position position these things in the traps. So there are no there are no physical linkers, but with the traps we could move these distances, and we could study whether this this object w uh, worked as a micro pump. So we were holding it, so it's not swimming around. Uh, but by doing these moves again and again, uh, it, it, if it's a swimmer, it should also be a pumper. And indeed, it pumped. Um, we then calculated that if it, if it wasn't a pump, but it, it was actually a swimmer, it would go very slow, but not zero. No. Okay, this is how it, it is in kind of in real time how we did our experiments, and then we played with various parameters of how much we moved and how fast we we actuated these moves. But up to now, so this is now non, not a static trap, but we had learned how to precisely um, code the timing so that we could do these moves. And, and then we just repeated the moves. The, up to now, there hasn't been any clever feedback. So, so we just recorded the movie and then studied where the traps, where the beads, and, and work out if, if this, from the movie, you can work out if this is pumping or not pumping by being very careful about where are the lasers and where, where are the beads, and what are the net forces at, at, at every instant in time. So you calculate, you, you measure the trajectories, you also compare them to simulations, which are the solid lines, and you, you integrate out to calculate whether this is, a, is actually putting a force into the fluid. So it, it is putting a force of uh, hundreds of piconewtons um, as, as the, the as a result of this uh, non-reciprocal motion. Okay, so, so the swimming, uh, the equivalent, well, the pumping flow, which would be equivalent to the swimming velocity, uh, would be of 0 0.2 microns per second, which is, it's poorer than, uh, say, an E. coli swimming, uh, much slower. So this was published, and, and lots of people uh, started looking at this paper, well, in, in the community, uh, because it was the first simple experiment after a, a series of, of theoretical papers uh, that have proposed uh, similar things. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you now is, is uh, was the second phase. We, we had learned how to build a tweezer, how to do that, that first initial phase of simple experiments. And then we wanted to do experiments on, on synchronization to, to go from, from how does, in some sense, we had looked at how does a single object manage to create a little bit of uh, pumping action. But then the more interesting question to us seemed, okay, now that you have, in, in the natu natural system, you have hundreds or thousands of these uh, individual little pumps, and clearly they, they are synchronizing and phase locking, uh, how can we do kind of some basic experiments to understand why, why they're phase locking? So there is no brain, there's no electrical impulse coordinating these things. This is a single cell. Probably there's not even like a calcium signal. So th these are what we think, these are actually uh, talking to each other through the fluid flow. So we wanted to do experiments that only had fluid flow by again moving colloids and, and work out what consequences and what kind of richness of properties we could get just by playing with, uh, with, with uh, the type of, uh, of motion and the rules of motion that we could give to the individual uh, phase oscillators. So there are some simpler biological systems that people look at, and they stand as kind of intermediate models between uh, what I will show you, which is just moving colloids, 
and the, the real important questions, which are these big waves that we, well, waves on a large scale that we have in the airways and also in the brain. Our, the fluids in our brain are also moved about by these, uh, the, uh, and we, we would die immediately if our, if our cilia stopped beating. So this is an algae called Chlamydomonas. It, it, in these two movies, it is held by a glass pipette. And uh, this algae only has uh, two cilia. So it's, it's a very beautiful system to do microscopy on. And uh, most of the time, it swims with this uh, motion that looks like a breaststroke swimming. And it goes straight. Again, those of you who have been through the hands-on with uh, Nicole and myself uh, have seen this in, the, in, in our microscope. And then sometimes it doesn't synchronize the two cilia. It has them out of phase. And in that situation, the algae chooses another probably random direction before switching back to going in phase and, and going straight again uh, for, for some seconds. And um, so this, uh, you might think, is, is uh, perhaps uh, a loss of synchronization. Maybe, maybe the, the system is, uh, is positioned uh, such that um, a fluctuation has some probability of, of uh, displacing it from, from in-phase synchronization and, uh, and, and giving it some time in a, in a, in a, in a, in a not phase-locked uh, uh, state. That's the kind of idea that we can explore with uh, colloids. So uh, we'll skip that movie. So what did we do? Well, the, the principle is that we're now thinking of replacing each of the beating cilia with uh, just uh, uh, one of our colloidal particles. And we then want to jiggle it back and forth so in the, in the natural systems, these things beat uh, somewhere between 10 hertz and uh, 50 hertz, depends on the system. But they are conserved. I mean, the one I showed you on the algae has the same molecules as the one which is present in the human being. So, so they are one of the most conserved organelles from plants to animals. And, uh, and, and they go um, a long way back in, uh, in, in evolutionary uh, time. Um, that means they're very efficient and, and very complex, and you can't really evolve it again in a slightly different way, uh, not easily. So, um, okay. So, we, in what sense can we can we change that very complicated uh, object to to just assume that it's a bead? Well, we, we are keeping a few things. We can keep a similar frequency, and we can keep similar fluid dynamics because uh, if these things are not too close to each other, then the fluid flow that they exert on each other is actually fairly well described by the, say, the, by the fluid flow that we can generate with a sphere. So the fluid dynamics, uh, I think, is not so controversial. The, what's more controversial is, is this thing, as it beats, I told you it has high drag, low drag. It is flexible. It, it can fluctuate. It, it can do, a, a, it's very rich. It has a lot of degrees of freedom. And actually, I, I will show you a picture later, that what's going on inside is itself a very rich dynamical system. Molecular motors are grabbing on, putting a little bit of force, uh, falling off. There's hundreds of these molecular motors constantly attaching force off, and all of that is force responsive. So, so inside here, there's a lot of feedback. OK, so we are coarse graining all of that complexity into simply uh, moving w one of our spheres. But we still we, we do have some room uh, to keep track of those degrees of freedom. We can, for example, move, uh, we can move fast and slow, we, we can change our profiles, um, we can move very rigidly, or we can allow jiggling during our moves. And those are the kind of simple, simple physics uh, points to start to, to, to try to account uh, for some of the complexity going on in the cilium. If the cilium is very flexible, we, well, we can move, we can do the jiggling, but with soft traps, which still allow fluctuations in, in, during the periodic, period, periodic motion. Uh, and that's the way we've headed into, into this problem. We, we've been trying to make uh, kind of experiments that at the same time had a well-defined physics, and we could, we could back them with, with, a, with a bit of an analytical argument and numerical simulations, but also always having in mind what the biological system was uh, so that we could actually talk to biologists and tell them that we were trying to answer uh, the questions that, that they thought were important. All right, so if you want to study synchronization, you, you can't just move beads the way we did with the micropump, because there, the kind of the phase relation between the beads was fixed by us. So it, it don't go study synchronization by fixing uh, the phase locking. You have to allow the phase to be free. So we came up with two strategies. One is um, 
One is dragging uh, a bead uh, on a closed loop with a with a um, with a, a, def a predefined force. So we predefine both the the orbit, which is this black line, and we predefine what force we're going to apply at each point in this orbit. So in the simplest case, this could be a circle, and we could be pushing the bead in the circle with a constant force. And then the the phase is basically the angle. Uh, that the bead is doing uh, relative, relative to some reference position. And, um, and if you have one, then it will start spinning at some, some period. If you have two of these, uh, they will both spin. If you make them identical, they, they will have the same period. Uh, and then in addition to the force that we're putting with the tweezer, they also have this hydrodynamic force. So that can couple them, and they might go in phase, for example. And then you can, you can have two or, say, up to ten. Typically, ten is the maximum that we can do experiments on. And in that orbit uh, model, you, you can play. You can then start playing with deforming the orbits. You can play with um, making the, the the force bigger at some point on that ellipse, etc. So you have, uh, and you can make that uh, that orbit more rigid, like a railway, like a little electric train model, or you can make it uh, a weak trapping, so you are weakly pushing it along, and it's still able also to do uh, tangential fluctuations. All of these things matter, and when we when we, I'm not going to show you today results of these. But you can make kind of very interesting regime diagrams of what collected dynamic comes out as a function of the details of how you drive stuff. And you can go back to your biological systems and look at the force versus time curves and try to map them onto these more simple force versus time models. And that can teach you whether, well, it can really answer the question whether hydrodynamics is the most important coupling mechanism in the biological system, which is still, in general, an open question. What I am going to show you a little bit in five minutes is are the results of uh, this other idea, um, another way to make a phase oscillator. We, I think I have a bigger, yes, okay. So we, st we, we, make, we have our harmonic trap, this yellow one. And, and uh, initially, imagine the bead is this red bead here, and it's, it's away from the minimum. So it will, it will feel a force that, that, that drags it towards the minimum of the harmonic well. Um, but but we, we image, so we don't move the yellow trap, but we image the position of the red beads uh, very quickly. And when it comes close to the minimum, say at this dashed yellow line here, we switch off the yellow trap and on this other uh, trap, which is a small distance away say, a few microns away. And suddenly, the bead it finds itself uh, well away from the minimum of the blue trap. The bead is kind of up here in the blue potential. And now it feels a forest to the right, and so it starts going right. We, again, we image it <clears throat> several times, and when we spot that it has reached this uh, dashed blue line, we switch the blue trap off, and we switch the yellow trap on again. And this we do automatically. It's a, it's a feedback loop. <clears throat> we I should also say, we, you need feedback here as well to maintain constant force on the bead. You need to know at every instant where is the bead, and you need to put the, the, the optical trap a, a certain distance ahead of the bead to give it a, a constant force. Here, also, there is feedback. You need to know where the bead is in order to decide if you're going to change the trap position or not. And when you let this go, then your bead is going back and forth with a well-defined amplitude. Uh, but the period is, is, uh, can adapt, and also, mo most importantly, the phase is completely free. <clears throat> so if there's another force from somewhere else that pushes it along a little bit, well, the phase will, will, will advance. Uh, or, or if you have several of these things, uh, they may, may or may not synchronize with each other. And here, <clears throat> the most simple um, kind of things you can play with are, are the shape of the potential. So I've drawn here... This, this curve, which is a, it's a bad parabola. But uh, you can also uh, have, say, a V, or, or you can have uh, potentials that are curves the other way around. And again, the idea is we've got kind of a playground of physics that physicists will care about, and, and perhaps uh, synchronization experts. But we can also go and talk to the biologists, because we can try to mimic with the shape that we're putting here. We can try to mimic what, say, the Chlamydomonas algae is doing as a function of its beating. We can put something that has the same curvature uh, as a function of where you are on the phase as, as the real biological system and see what type of synchronization comes out. Okay, this is a little animation 
of what each uh, phase oscillator will be doing, and we can have from one to, to 10 of these guys. Okay, so our first experiments were, were with two, and, um, and we did games uh, such as uh, moving them more far apart. Uh, so this Q is basically an order parameter, tells us uh, how much synchronization there is, and whether it's out of phase or in phase, and zero is, uh, is, uh, is, um, is uh, no synchronization. Uh, well, the color code is, is how much, so these, are, these are the distributions of Q over an experiment. So the color tells you how peaked uh, a certain uh, um, uh, fa a phase lock is. So in this case, these were harmonic traps doing this, uh, this active motion that I call geometric switch. By moving them close, uh, the distribution closed up and became peaked and in, in uh, close to anti-phase uh, phase locking. And moving them away, you, you lose synchronization because, uh, uh, because thermal noise uh, starts kind of uh, shifting you off, uh, off the phase lock. And this is just the, the same curve. So this Q close to one means uh, anti-phase motion. Uh, and as you move them away, or, or actually this plot is, is as you deface them. So you, you can also do <coughs> typical games that you do with, uh, with phase oscillators. They might have identical frequencies, or, or you can get them uh, slightly off, and you can study how, how to what extent this, the phase locking is robust as you deface them. And then if you go to multiples of the frequency, you might find another region of, uh, of phase lock. Where, and, and these things happen also with these uh, hydrodynamically coupled uh, oscillators. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we can uh, basically, with the optical trap, we, we were becoming, so this is now like four years later, we're becoming better at playing with the optical trap. And, and by time sharing, by time sharing very quickly over, uh, over neighboring positions, you can create optical landscapes. So, so instead of having simply harmonic traps, you can, you can play with putting very quickly different uh, harmonic traps all over the place, and the sum of that will look like uh, a, a potential that, that you can decide. You can have, you can have potentials that, uh, that even have kind of uh, almost like harmonic upside down um, if you want to. And this, um, oh, these movies should give you, uh, should show you how important it is to How important it is to ha uh, uh, this may okay good. How important the potential is. The, um, this these are the harmonic ones and they go in antiphase, which which are the curves I've shown you up to now. If you put subharmonic, they actually go the, the, these two beads synchronize in phase, and if you put lines, the beads don't know how to synchronize. Uh, this is because a line has no time reversal. Uh, and so there's no information there about whether you should go towards synchronization or away from synchronization. The result is you don't synchronize. Um, what, that this is anti-phase and this is in-phase uh, is actually a long story. I don't have enough time to explain to you. But we got to the bottom of that. Uh, and this is kind of, as a function of the curvature of the potential, you, you actually get this nice kind of transition from uh, phase to anti-phase. And we use these... these um, uh, these experiments uh, in, in relation to this Chlamydomonas uh, organism about, uh, that has been measured uh, very accurately by, by lots of groups. And so, so the, the, the positions and the speeds of the flagellum have been published. And you, can you can go back and calculate what the force is and compare it to the, the simple things that I've shown you up to now. Um, <clears throat> okay, as well as the potential, also the, how you lay out your oscillators is, is very important. Some of you are playing with networks, so I thought I should show this. Uh, so three is a frustrated system because I've set them up so that they all want to go in antiphase, and, and I'm jiggling them along the tangent. But the three can't go in out of phase with uh, in, can't go in antiphase with everybody else. And actually, it turns out that most of the time it decides to go all in phase, which would be it's the most counterintuitive thing. The even polygons. Uh, are, uh, can fit the out of antiphase uh, between neighbors, and that's what they do. And the odd ones, so five and seven, etc., uh, they set up a traveling wave, clockwise and anticlockwise, uh, at the same time. That's not obvious by eye, but if you analyze those uh, motions, you that's what you get. Okay, so that also we made sense with uh, through the Ozine tensor. And in my last few minutes, I just want to show you where the project is going now. <coughs> 
I mean, we're still doing some colored experiments because the biological systems, a lot of them are doing what they do in viscoelastic, system, viscoelastic liquids. And so we, we are kind of pushing that frontier also with the simple systems. So learning how, how fluid is pumped and how synchronization can happen if you have both viscosity and elasticity in your liquid. But also a lot of effort is going to, to these cells, which are human airway cells. Uh, so the, these are movies from the lab. This beating is happening at, at around uh, 10 hertz. So the movies are a little bit slowed down. Um, those, uh, these are healthy cells. And um, let me just, uh, right. You can see uh, very, very flexible filaments, um, asymmetry in what they do in one direction compared to the other direction. These are all signs of uh, healthy, well-structured cilia that are doing what they should do. Um, let me show you a bad one, and then I go back to the, uh, oh, give me a bad one. All right, so there are various genetic diseases, uh, either of the cilia or of the mucus, that give you bad beating. So this is, um, this is a genetic disease. Some, uh, it's fairly rare, but those people who are born with this um, have a lot of problems. And this is cystic fibrosis, which is much more common, and it's a disease of the mucus. So here the beating is impaired because the mucus is too thick. So those are the reasons why there's actually a community of doctors as well as biologists who care about uh, these cilia. So I told you that they are conserved. This, the molecular structure is essentially the same from algae throughout uh, all, all of the animals. Um, they, they are <clears throat> 100 nanometers uh, wide, these filaments, and uh, tens of microns long. And they have these microtubules in, in blue. Uh, these are fairly rigid uh, um, structures that are present also in other parts of the cytoskeleton of cells. And then there are these molecular motors that cause a, a sliding, put, put a force between the microtubules and allow the, 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 the tubes to slide against each other and the overall cilium to bend. Um, and this, I mentioned, is, is, is itself a very rich um, nonlinear system because it spontaneously sets itself up to beat at 10 hertz. And that is itself, I mean, there are a few groups looking at that, but nobody has a nice clean model that can be used as an element uh, together with, uh, with then coupling more than one together, for example. So, so you really realize how there are, this is a question that spans scales and, and areas of expertise. And uh, it's actually a very broad, kind of, it's a big, big question, uh, putting everything together. OK, so we're putting our, our cells in, um, that, that these are airway cells, and they like to be in contact with air. So they, they receive, there's a little dish so that they receive liquid from below, and they are exposed to air from above. And one of our questions, in fact, what Nicola is trying to answer, is whether we can determine um, if these, these collective waves that these cells have, are they, are they uh, sustained through the hydrodynamic coupling, which is what we had in the models of colloids for sure, or, or is there something else? Is there perhaps vibrations which, which they um, can uh, uh, propagate to each other because they are in contact? And to do that, the first experiment is to uh, try to put uh, like a little dam and see if there is synchronization left and right. Uh, and then also try to kind of dig uh, a trench and see if there is synchronization left and right. So these two experiments together should be able to tell us um, if, if the wave is uh, being sustained by hydrodynamics or, or by uh, contact. And, and maybe Nicola in a few months will be able to tell us the answer. Uh, we don't yet know. Um, and uh, the other thing we're doing is, is these movies OK, we, we take, we, um, basically, that's, that cell culture can be bent. And we can look at the profile. And that's how you can get those uh, videos of, uh, of the cilia themselves beating. Uh, and in those movies, OK, let me skip ahead. And then I just need to come back for a second. In these movies from the side, you can actually trace. Uh, it's going slow. Oh. Right. Okay. You can, can you can uh, you, you can do segmentation. This at the moment we're doing by hand because it's quite tricky. You can segment the position of a, a, a one particular cilium as a function of time, 
And then um, this is color coded by what is the curvature along the filament. And what you see as a function of time and going up the cilium, so the arc length from zero, is that th there are traveling waves of this curvature. So the, the, the shapes of the cilium are actually, say, it's, it's a kink which is being pushed from, from the base to, to the top. This uh, is, uh, for in airways, this hadn't been measured before in airway cells. In, in uh, sperm cells, uh, this was known, that the sperm manages to swim because it's, it's making a, like a sinusoidal wave that it travels to the back. I was surprised to see that actually something ev evidently very similar is happening also in these, these other uh, cilia here. Okay, so in the very, very last minutes, and then I will stop, I just want to connect to what you're doing in our hands-on. So we, we developed, so when we have the cell culture dish situation, and we make a movie from the top, then this is what the movie looks like. It, so here, the scale of the cells, so the black things are basically cells. So this is a movie at fairly low magnification, but it's what we need to, to go and look for collective waves. And in fact, if you stare at this for long enough, you can convince yourselves um, that there, is, there are patterns of synchronized motion um, on a scale which is bigger than the scale of a, of a single cell. It's almost like also a little vortex here, but there's definitely things are beating together on, uh, on a scale of, say, between there and there. And uh, to quantify that is, is not so simple. Um, in the past, people had simply tried to look at the Fourier, Fourier transform locally, and then um, th that gives you kind of quite complicated and noisy data sets. And that's where we, we went to this uh, DDM technique that some of you has, have seen in our hands-on uh, that relies on taking image differences, well, a video, then image differences, Fourier transforms of that, and, and looking at the, 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 the essentially the, the dynamics of the Fourier modes that come from these uh, image differences. Um, it's a very powerful technique, and in this particular case of the complicated movie, it, it allows us, without any, any, any need to segment anything and, and without setting any image analysis parameters, to get both the, the beating um, frequency of the cilium and perhaps more interestingly, um, by, by looking at um, how these signals decay as a function of the, of the lag time uh, to get an idea about spatial, uh, spatial and uh, temporal uh, coherence of, of the cilia beat. Okay, so for those of you who are interested, perhaps you should come and talk to me. The way we get uh, spatial coherence is to compare this DDM analysis on a whole set of uh, boxes of different size. And as you go to a smaller and smaller box, you are analyzing dynamics, which is on a, a smaller and smaller scale, and you get more and more kind of coherent motion. And this, kind of this transition here is as a function of what area are we choosing as our, our area to, to average on, essentially. And we get a, kind of a transition in the decay time at a scale which is a, of a few, corresponds to a few cell diameters. And that means that in this uh, cell culture, where, where the cilia were not particularly aligned, it was just how they've grown, uh, the, 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 synchronize, the synchronization distance is, uh, is a few cells. In, in, uh, in our real organisms, through development, the cilia actually grow very well aligned, and you would expect then the metachronal waves to be able to propagate over distances even beyond uh, a few cell diameters. So, I apologize if I crammed a lot of material in. I, I uh, this is why it goes very slow. Um, I've shown you, um, I, I've given you a flavor for for the basic physics. Um, in my mind, I also had the idea that I've shown you what we were able to do ten years ago, which was very simple, and what we've been able to build up, which has been both through being better with our experiments and by. Uh, learning better what, what were the actual biological questions and, and, and the medical relevance of what we might be able to, to approach. And what we're doing now is actually working with these, uh, these kind of real cells and, and getting cells, getting ready to receive cells from, from the hospital as well, from, from patients uh, that are being um, cared for by clinicians. Uh, and that should be kind of exci an exciting new phase uh, for our future. Thanks.